Welcome everyone to the 5,353rd meeting of the Rotary Club of San Jose. Yay! It's thrilling to be here with you again. I'd like to thank uh, the membership committee chaired by Matt Bell for greeting us all in the uh, lobby. They're of course one of the most important committees we have and we know we will be relying on them to keep us well stocked with members throughout the year. No pressure at all right there. So we've got a fun treat to open today's meeting. We're gonna have uh, two songs by performers from City Lights Theater Company's uh, production of Fun Home, which is currently running and runs until August 21st. Uh, first, we are gonna hear from Penelope De Silva, who plays Small Allison in the show. You'll, if you go see it, you'll understand. Uh, and she'll be followed by Alexandra Ornes, who plays Middle Allison. Uh, they will be accompanied by Sam Cesaros, the musical director for the show. So please, take it away. Someone just came in the door Like no one I ever saw before I feel, I feel, I don't know where you came from. Wish I did, I feel so dumb. I feel your swagger and your bearing and the just right clothes you're wearing, your short hair and your dungarees and your lace up boots. And your keys, oh, your ring of keys. I thought it was supposed to be wrong, but you seem okay with being strong. I want you so. It's probably conceited to say, but I think we're like, in a certain way, I... Uh, your swagger and your bearing and the just right clothes you're wearing, your short hair and your dungarees and your lace-up boots and your keys, oh, your ring of keys. Feel my heart saying hi in this hall tonight. Why am I the only one who sees your beautiful? No, I mean handsome. Your swagger and your bearing and the just right clothes you're wearing, your short hair and your dungarees and your lace up boots and your keys, oh, your ring of keys. I know you. I know you. I know you. What happened last night? Are you really here? Joan, 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 Joan. Hi, Joan! Do you wake up, Joan? Oh my God, last night. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, last night. 
I got so excited, I was too enthusiastic. Thank you for not laughing. Well, you laughed a little bit at one point when I was touching you and said I might lose consciousness, which you said was adorable. And I just have to trust that you don't think I'm an idiot or some kind of an animal. I never lost control due to overwhelming lust. But I must say that I'm changing my major to Joan. I'm changing my major to sex with Joan. I'm changing my major to sex with Joan with a minor in kissing Joan foreign study to Jones in her thighs, a seminar on Jones' ass in her Levi's, and Jones crazy brown eyes. Joan, I feel like Hercules. Oh God, that sounds ridiculous. Just keep on sleeping through this and I'll work on calming down. So by the time you've woken up, I'll be cool, I'll be collected, and I'll have felt some dignity, but who needs dignity? Cause this is so much better. I'm radiating happiness. Will you stay here with me for the rest of the semester? We won't need any food. We'll live off sex alone. Sex with Joan. I am writing a thesis on Joan. It's a cutting edge field and my mind is blown. I would gladly stay up every night to hone my compulsory skills with Joan. I will study my way down her spine, familiarize myself with her well-made outline while she researches mine. I don't know who I am. I've become someone new. Nothing I just did is anything I would do. Overnight, everything changed. I am not prepared. I'm dizzy, I'm nauseous, I'm shaky. I'm scared. Am I falling into nothingness or flying into something so sublime? I don't know, but I'm changing my major to Joan. I thought all my life I'd be all alone, but that was before I was lying prone in this dorm room bed here with Joan. Look, she drooled on the pillow. So sweet, all sweaty and tangled up in my bed sheet. And my heart feels complete. Let's never leave this room. How about we stay here till finals? I'll go to school forever. I'll take out a dementedly huge high interest loan. Cause I'm changing my major to Joe. Thank you so much, Penelope, Alexandra, and Sam. Uh, if you'd like to hear more, like I said, the show is running through August 21st. I know I, if you want to see me there, I'll be not on stage, but I'll be in the audience on Friday night, so you can say hi. Uh, but we really appreciate them coming to uh, join us, and uh, they are going off now to stay in a bubble so that they don't uh, cause the show any problems with COVID or anything. So at this time, could we have our Red Badgers with the traveling mics uh, please stand up and introduce themselves? Why don't we start with you? I'm Ashley Pass, and I'm a Red Badger for one more month. It's going to be a good month, though. Hi, I'm Leslie Corselia, and um, I, I am no longer a Red Badger as of the 16th of next month. Okay. So, See, we're, we're, getting, we're getting you guys in while we can. So uh, Rotarians, visiting Rotarians and guests would like to please stand, and we'll get you introduced. And while we are waiting for that, I 
Let's see, why don't we head over to Bert first. Hi there, I'm Bert George. I have two very special guests, Joyce, and your last name again, Joyce? Monda and Jackie Smith. Jackie, Joyce, we're glad you could be here. Hi, I'm, I'm Karen here. Fox. Hi, Karen. And uh, this is my guest, Ava Lee. Ava is a realtor with Intero Real Estate Services. It's her second meeting, and she's a prospective Rotary member with our club. Great. Welcome, Ava. Hi, my name is Ramiro Torres. Uh, these are my guests, Sam. Uh, she's going to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo for architecture, grade school. That's why I went to school. <laughs> and she's our intern for the summer. Um, Jorge Romero, it's the VP of uh, Business Development for Top Architecture and the prospect for being a Rotarian. Wonderful. Great to have you both here. Okay, do we have anyone else? Let's get a microphone then to Dave Peterson. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm here to introduce a, a wonderful group of uh, students and their school advisor from Santa Teresa High School who uh, have uh, joined us after they are preparing themselves for the new school year. Uh, these students uh, met at my house uh, with the advisor and had a uh, board bonding, if you will, for a couple of hours. And then we thought it'd be nice for them to join us for lunch. So as I call your name, just uh, stay in and, and uh, be recognized. Clara who is a graduated senior, and you met her in the past, uh, Savannah, uh, Caitlin, Allison, Simran, Haley, Natalie. Uh, their president is Emily Duong, and the uh, co-vice president, Kylie Nguyen, is gonna take just a minute here and uh, tell us about the Rotary Youth Leadership Awards that our club sponsored two of the students to go to. I'd also like to introduce Ms. Demas, who is the school advisor and a longtime companion in regards to that club because it's been a great adventure as this group has uh, grown. So, Kylie. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Kylie Nguyen, and my co who unfortunately could not be here is Brenda Jung. So my co who unfortunately cannot be here is Brenda Dung, and we are both rising juniors and San Teresa Interact's co-vice president. So RILA was explained to me as a brief one week camp where I could further develop my leadership skills, such as public speaking and improve my current skill set. Campers were assigned to one workshop and could put a preference while applying, so I decided to put my first choice as speech and debate. I'm a very nervous public speaker actually, but I was determined to try something new with hope that I could find confidence while sharing my ideas and thoughts with others. So during our first day with the workshop, I established that my goal was to be able to speak and present with more fluidity. So as I give this presentation, I hope that my growth will showcase itself. Due to the experience given to me, I was able to step outside of my previous comfort zone and grew as a leader and a person. And I would like to give a huge thank you to Dave and San Jose Rotary, of course, for sponsoring me and Brenda to Ryla. Thank you. Uh, President Sal, I just would ask uh, all of you to remember, we have five sponsored high schools uh, that we promote and support throughout our San Jose community, and we welcome additional Rotary members to join our committee, along with Steve and Pat and a few that weren't able to be here today. So thank you very much for the time here today. Thank you for your leadership with the committee, Dave. And go Saints, I'm a proud San Jose High School graduate myself, so thrilled to see uh, leadership continuing from that school. At this time, I'd like to welcome up Bert George for a tribute to Peter Smith, along with, I believe, John Kennett and Steve Borkenhagen. Back in June, we lost one of the most important pillars of this Rotary Club that many of you probably didn't know how important Peter was. Peter Smith, Dr. Peter Smith, gave anonymously to everything and this club was a huge benefactor rotoplast and everything that we did peter gave to and he's going to be missed very much and jackie i'm so happy you're here today uh, peter was born 1935 in manhattan he passed away this past june 12th 
Uh, he uh, attended Catholic University in Washington, D.C. Uh, he went to dental school at Northwestern. Uh, he joined the Navy and was stationed at Treasure Island, which must have been really nice. Uh, he started his practice in Willow Glen, right down the street from actually where we are, and a very successful uh, dentist. I don't have a lot of time to tell some of the stories, but some of the stories with his patients and clients are just amazing at the care that he gave and care that he gave their families after some of the members passed. It was unbelievable. They love music together. They love traveling together. Uh, he supported higher education. He supported the symphony, the opera. It goes on and on and on. He was uh, San Jose Elk, a proud San Jose Elk. Uh, he was a member of this Rotary Club since 2008. And uh, like I said, he loved Rotoplast and he loved my little Cindy and, uh, and gave and gave and gave to us. And it was just beautiful. I have Steve and John here to say a couple words. Peter Smith was a wonderful Rotarian. He had an impish smile, and I looked forward to seeing him anytime he was around, because he always said something funny. He had a great sense of humor, and he made me laugh every time I encountered him. He also had a great heart of gold. And Peter, I'm sorry, Bert's already let the cat out of the bag, but everything that Peter gave to, he gave anonymously. And he didn't want any recognition. He didn't want anyone to know how generous he was being. He supported every single Rotary project, every single relief effort that we did. And he would walk up and put money in my hand and say, this is for X, Y, Z, and I really don't want anyone to know. At Christmas time, most of us bring teddy bears and board games. Peter would come with between $1,000 and $2,000 worth of gift cards from Target. And he'd walk up and hand them to me and say, can you make sure that these get to Sacred Heart? He just had um, an overwhelming ability to make you feel good about what he was doing, and, uh, but he didn't want any credit for himself. He, um, we're we're, we're going to miss his leprechaun smile. He had just a, a, a unique way of kind of sneaking up on you. And we're going we're gonna to miss that smile, but we're going to remember that he always shared his pot of gold with everyone and every activity that Rotary had. I met Peter and Jackie back in the 70s. I had a really interesting job. Um, it's part of the reason why I have so many friends today, which is I was running a restaurant and I was the guy at the front who would greet everybody. And, and when you do that, you meet literally tens of thousands of people every year. Well, the staff and I would only remember a few of them. You know, sometimes it was just, you know, the obnoxious asshole at table 13. <laughs> but uh, that, was, that was not Peter and Jackie. And all of the staff would always remember Peter. He did something that in my 40, almost 50 years of work in the restaurant business, no one, no one ever did this. So what Peter would do, and John talked about, the imp, talked about the impish grin, but I call it Peter's Cheshire Cat smile. He'd walk over to the bar after lunch, and he'd go to the bartender or the server, and he'd say, I'll flip you for 100 bucks. And this was when 100 bucks for a server was a lot of money. I'm going to guess minimum wage in those days was about $1.50 or something like that. And so sometimes they'd say no, and he'd say, okay. But when they said yes, Peter would flip the coin and then put it in his pocket and give him 100 bucks. So whether they won or lost the coin flip, I, I, I think I wasn't supposed to tell Jackie about this because those are. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, uh, those are some of, some of the high points for, for our staff and everybody in the restaurants. And I know uh, Ulipia wasn't the only place Jackie and Peter went, you know, they, they, they went everywhere. So I think there are a lot of servers with $100 bills in their pockets because of Peter. And uh, Jackie's, uh, let me read the, the following, which she wrote. Uh, Born in Manhattan, spending much of his formative years in big cities, Peter enjoyed museums, theater, and strolling in manicured city parks. His idea of camping and, and admiring nature was a suite at the Bayshore Inn in Vancouver, overlooking the Yacht Harbor, looking out at the nearby mountains. 
any of you who have been up there know how spectacular that is. For years, dragged by Jackie on trips to Sicily, the Dordogne, the Greek Isles, Yucatan, Scotland, and Ireland, he'd had it with nature, particularly going through caves and going over piles of rocks. It was in Ireland where he stood before the ruins of a castle, declaring himself to be a charter member of the NMR Club. No more ruins club. From then on, it was nice hotels in New York, Chicago, and San Francisco. Uh, I feel really honored to have had Peter as a friend uh, all these years, and uh, I'll, I'll never forget his smirk, and he always made me laugh when I saw him, so uh, we'll miss you, Peter Smith. Peter was a wonderful man, good Rotarian, and he will be missed. Moving on, I'd like to bring up Jeff Hare, who has a special presentation for us today. Thank you, President Sal. And uh, I know Peter would have uh, really appreciated this because he came to me as we were doing this program and was very supportive as well, again, quietly uh, in all cases. Four years ago, uh, San Jose State President Mary Papazian approached the club with an invitation to partner with the oldest public university in the state and have the ninth largest Rotary Club in the world uh, join them in some capacity. And in meeting that challenge under President Shara, uh, Gary uh, Shara, and a team from our downtown development committee, John Kovaleski, myself, and the local impact committee headed then by Steve Borkenhagen, joined up, came together with an idea to create a, what we called the Rotary San Jose State Challenge Award. It was a way to incentivize students to study and come up with solutions to some of the problems for a sustainable community touching on topics such as affordable housing, transportation, and the other things that we have to deal with. Um, in the course of this, we partnered up with the Department of Regional and Urban Planning, and it was assigned to then assistant associate professor, now Professor Serena Alexander, who I've been working with for the past four years on this program. And thanks to John Kovaleski, we were able to get some seed money from Google to help fund a scholarship program. Again, the objective here was to get the students working on their master's program in urban planning to try and study some of these uh, very important topics. We have given seven, seven awards, and I'm here and pleased today to present the recipients from the May 22 graduation, uh, Ziomara Aguirre and Anneli Damave. Now, Ziomara did her paper uh, talking about the exodus, which you've heard about. In fact, Russell Hancock touched on the fact that there was this massive exodus from the area, but where did they go? As your Mara's paper talks about how they, the impact on their transfer to Tracy and Holliston, and the impacts that this massive migration from San Francisco and San Jose had on the communities of those two areas. She studied the effects on the social impacts and the housing issues. Um, she currently is working as an intern an emerging mobility team for the city of San Jose. 
Emily Damabe did her paper. It was probably the most comprehensive study of the homelessness situation, looking at private and nonprofit organizations and local government responses to the homeless crisis. And it, um, a very, her compendium is just a resource material that we'll be posting so you can have that available to you. She currently is working as community relations director for Vice Mayor Chappie uh, Jones. But I understand that in keeping with Pam Foley's uh, pattern, she's been given a new position and Pam Foley has stolen her to come work for her. Where have we heard that before? So anyway, it's my honor. Thank you for the opportunity to be here to present the recipients of the Rotary San Jose State Challenge Award for 2022. And next, where is Kathleen Thomas? Kathleen, why don't you come up and talk to us about the Red Badge Pause Project? Hello, and to the Interact student, I just want to say many of us still aspire to more clarity and fluidity in our public speaking. So good reminder and good luck to us both. <laughs> Um, first slide on the back. There we go. So um, back in November, Christine Burroughs remind you know shared that we had shared a community grant with Animal Assisted Happiness, great organization. Following that, in May, the Red Badgers joined with the Pause Committee, and we did a project re-landscaping and um, filling in, putting river rock, and doing a lot of things there. I thought it would be more interesting than listening to me to listen to some of the youth ambassadors that spend time and just they can say a little bit about their experience there. Hi everyone, my name is Enzo, I'm 18. So I'm also a master, but I'm recently a staff member. I've been working uh, with the farm before I go to college. Probably one of my favorite memories is when we brought the animals to a school for the deaf. Um, I remember we outsourced and we got a few volunteers that we're proficient in ASL and it was really great. We got to communicate with them and they were just really excited and it was really special. Um, I'm Desiree and I've been at the I've been volunteering at the farm for three and a half years. And one of my favorite memories at the farm is during open hours. So I go every second Sunday of the month and there's always this one girl who comes up to me to play with the bunny. The first time she came, she was really shy and she didn't like to talk. But now she always likes to play with the bunny, ask me questions about the bunny, and I think that's really fun. Hi everyone, my name is Eli and I've been volunteering at Animal Assisted Happiness for just around a year now. And what I really love about the farm is so we have something called uh, farm tours, where we're really just taking care of the animals and making sure that the farm is in good condition uh, for our visitors. But What's really special about the farm is open hours, where we get to um, work with the public and actually play with the animals and um, uh, work with kids to really enhance their um, time there. And so what's really special about the farm is just how fulfilling it is to work with students and see what, what it's like when their face lights up uh, when petting animals and working with them. Thank you. Thank you, and that's just another great example of one of our committees uh, working together to bring some good to our community. Charlie McCollum, can you come up and introduce our speaker? We're going to skip through this, hold that for next week, because we're running behind. Hi everybody. Um, our speaker today is Michael Ogilvy. He's the director of public art for the city of San Jose. 
Before coming to San Jose, Michael worked on numerous public arts projects and programs for the city of Las Vegas, as well as Clark County, Nevada, and the Michael Kohler, John Michael Kohler Arts Center. He received a BA in art from the University of Nevada, Reno, and a master's in fine arts painting from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. He has exhibited his artwork nationally, internationally, and produced five graphic novels. It is his belief that public art is not a luxury, but a necessity for a vibrant community. Would you please welcome Michael Ogilvy? Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Sal. And thank you all for sharing with me some of your time so that I can share with you a little bit about the public art program for San Jose. I know many of you probably know about the public art program or are aware of it or, or have some, some public artworks in mind, and hopefully I'll be able to uh, share with you things that maybe you're, you're not familiar with. Um, but what I will be speaking with you today about is, is really how public art adds to the quality of life. And as Charlie said, it really enriches our life and, and how, how public art is selected, how it's located, as well as how the master plan guides this process. So if uh, I do have some, some slides I'm going to show you. And just I was given a heads up that as soon as I switch over to uh, the digital slides, um, my face is going to go away. So lucky for you, right? <laughs> but uh, thank you uh, again. And I'm going to just share my screen here. And I will come back for any questions that you have at the end of this. Uh, so here we go. So you should see the first slide on there, uh, which just says San Jose Public Art. And John or Leslie or anybody, if you, if you don't see that, just let me know. All right, well, the first thing I'd like to talk to you about is, is public art funding. So our, the city of San Jose's public art program, I mean, you can't have public art without funding. And you know, just like any, any uh, work that's done in any field, workers need to be paid. And so the city enacted in 1984 a percent for art ordinance. Uh, at that time, 1% of uh, designated capital improvement projects, and you might hear me say CIP, that's what that stands for, capital improvement projects, 1% uh, of that is it goes to public art. Here's a, here's a little graph that kind of show, uh, shows the breakout. So the capital project is really the base project, and that's where 99% of the budget goes, and then 1% of that will go to public art that could either be uh, integrated into the building, uh, installed in the landscaping. Sometimes we'll even bring an artist on board to inform on the overall design process. And I'll show examples of all of this as, as we proceed with the conversation. A little fun graphic I like to show, uh, just to kind of give you an idea of the relevance of, of, of public art to capital improvement projects. Um, generally the base project in a funding sense is the whale. That's the project that gets, I mean, the, the capital improvement project. So that could be a library, that could be a police station, that could be a fire station, that could be a community center, environmental building, park, bridge, so on and so forth. Every um, one of those projects, the bulk of the budget is, it goes to that base project. And, and so public art in a lot of ways is like the barnacle on a whale. We're the little small piece of that whale. Now, that's that's in a funding sense. In a uh, relevant sense to the community, generally public art is what people are most interested in. Uh, it's hard to get people excited about a stormwater pump station, but when you say we're going to do an artwork that honors the history of their community, people come out and get activated about that. So it becomes a way for, for the community to really um, express their their sentiment about who they are to not just the artist, but the city that's driving the project. So city officials can really get that that input from from the community. And just a little bit of public art by the numbers. So we have four hundred plus artworks in the collection, uh, and that's citywide. Uh, we have 
43 active capital improvement projects, and we have 21 uh, non-capital improvement projects. Those are fund projects funded through other measures, such as grants or budget documents or council requests, uh, or sometimes even private uh, partnerships. We have three uh, exhibit spaces in City Hall, so there's three gallery spaces we program. We have three full-time employees, and, and I'm included in that. And we ha all of our artworks are maintained and conserved uh, throughout the life of the work. Uh, we do have about 20 artworks that are in deep, what we call deep restoration, which is a major overhaul of that, that artwork due to vandalism, due to just age, due to pollution, whatever. I mean, these things are out there in the real world, and so they they tend to um, fall within the second law of thermodynamics, which is uh, systems tend toward chaos. So uh, things fall apart and, and they need to be repaired. Uh, so our public art work plan, I talked a little bit about it. It's comprised of the capital projects, uh, community engagement, maintenance and conservation, arts commission and public art committee duties, as well as other committee duties. Uh, City Hall exhibits, downtown and airport focuses, strategic planning, as well as, as equity initiatives. And our process is really important. And our process is really governed by the master plan, but the, the process really starts with funding. So we get the funding that's allocated. Uh, that funding becomes part of a work plan that we present to the Public Art Committee and the Arts Commission, and those are public meetings. And then it's finally folded into the overall CIP, uh, Capital Improvement Project um, work plan every year that goes to council for approval. Uh, so once that funding is approved, we do a, a briefing uh, with, with the, the commissioners and stakeholders on the project. And we really kind of have to triage projects. We do have, we have a lot of projects that are happening. So we have to make sure that, that the projects that have the construction deadlines, or there's a lot of political sentiment to, uh, towards a project, we have to really kind of push those to the top and try and make sure we work the ones that are, that are the most critical and the other ones that aren't as critical, that aren't tied to those deadlines, we will get to them as we can. Uh, so once they're triaged, we really kind of do a, a request for qualifications. And the request for qualifications is asking artists to apply. It's basically saying, hey, are you interested in this project? Please apply. And we use our um, email network. Uh, we use a call for entry post. We post on social media. Uh, we do a lot of recruiting, word of mouth. And so this is all how we would get, get artists to apply. And then, excuse me, once they apply, uh, we put together a public art core team, which is really kind of the review panel comprised of neighborhood residents, uh, comprised of sometimes commissioners, comprised of stakeholders, of people who are, are, are interested or live in the neighborhood, as well as artists and arts professionals. And that group, uh, that, that public art core team will select the artist. And then we will contract the artist. And so once we've contracted the artist, the fun really kind of begins. That's when the design development, the community input becomes really important. Um, the artists, once they're on board, we do a, a visioning process. Uh, we try to do up to three visioning meetings with the community. So where the artwork is going to go, we'll go to that community. We'll have community meetings at, this, at the centers and the artists will be able to provide um, their their input, the community will get to meet the artists and the artists will get to know a little bit about the community and what the community's interests are. And, and really these visioning meetings do help inform the overall design uh, that the artists will come up with. They're kind of like seeds of inspiration. Once the, um, the, the meetings have been conducted, the artist goes into design development. The artist will create a concept. A little, the, the artist will do the research first uh, and the visioning is part of that create a concept, then a schematic. And if it does require engineering, it goes through a develop, uh, development phase where we, we get construction documents for that. Um, murals usually don't require engineering unless there's some sort of rigging that's gonna be uh, used to climb a building or uh, some sort of a, a hanging apparatus or hanging hardware that, that requires heavy weight uh, the, to be able to support heavy weight. Once the design is complete, it goes to the Public Art Committee for uh, ratification or approval, and, and their job is really to approve of, of artworks that go on city property, and that's a th an authority that City Council has delegated to them. And once they approve, then the artist begins the fabrication of the of the artwork, and that could that could be uh, 
literally going to a wall and painting on the wall, or it could be going to their studio and welding a large sculpture. Um, and sometimes it's it's other things like they'll work with a separate fabricator to in integrate into an infrastructure project. Our master plan vision is really to prioritize innovative public art, art projects uh, at three regional destinations, and that's the downtown area, uh, the airport, as well as, as North San Jose. But we have projects citywide, so they're in all, dis all districts. Uh, we incorporate public art in high traffic corridors and pedestrian thoroughfares. This is really for visibility and to just really activate and create a vibrant uh, environment for people. We want to continue to create projects in community gathering spaces, integrate public art in long-term planning initiatives, establish ongoing collaborative planning relationships with other city departments, encourage private financial participation in public art, and really clarify the, the ground rules for funding public art projects and apply them equally across the board, uh, building in more flexibility for how funds can be allocated and exploring um, public art and private development as well. So now that I've kind of, kind of given you the, the synopsis of the program, I'm going to show you some fun stuff. So the you know, public art really can activate space and really can enhance public safety. Um, a, a few examples of that. This was a mural that we completed during the pandemic at the convention center. The area of the convention center that this mural went in uh, did occasionally would have encampments by it that would get tagged. It was really kind of an area that was neglected and created a uh, an inactive zone for nefarious activity to occur. It wasn't illuminated very well either. So we really brought an artist on board to not just paint a mural, but enhance, help enhance the, the lighting within the space. Uh, the artist we brought on board was Mona Carone, and she's a, a Bay Area artist, local. She is uh, internationally known, famous. She paints murals all over the world uh, in these really large scale murals and sometimes high rises that are 27 feet high. And her work really highlights uh, local flora that sort of breaks through the, the infrastructure. So, you know, flora that just grows wild through the asphalt or through concrete and that, that's natural to the environment. And so she focuses on those and really illuminates the beauty of these little things we often ignore in our, in our urban environment. Another project uh, which was funded by a Art Place grant as well as a partnership with the Downtown Association is Sensing You by Dan Corson. Uh, some of you might recognize this area as the pilgrimage to the SAP arena to go see a Sharks game or a performance. Uh, this area is, prior to this was really kind of notorious also for, for blight um, and, and, and litter and tagging. And it was a, sort of a dark space that people had to you know, go through before they would go to their event from downtown to the arena. And so an artist was brought on board to really create an active, fun environment. And the artist that that uh, we worked with was Dan Corson. And Dan Corson created uh, these these lifesavers, these, these uh, rings. You need a lifesaver when you're going to the shark tank. And he uh, created a system that could recognize a pedestrian traffic. And based off of sensing that pedestrian traffic, an algorithm generates a lighting program. And so that's, if you're ever doing that pilgrimage, uh, this, you can, if you look hard enough, you can find the sensors, walk by the sensors and watch them change. It's kind of fun. Uh, another project where we received a national endowment for the arts grant uh, to uh, create a, a, a performance space uh, in, a, in, in, in a shade structure, in, a, in an area that, that uh, a lot of first Friday events take place. And it was, it, it, you know, we heard from the community that shade is needed and we really just want a place uh, that, that we can relax and, and, and sit down and enjoy performances. And so the project that came out of that was Urban Rooms uh, by uh, Foreman and Cruz, the studio Foreman and Cruz. They designed a interchangeable uh, performance stage with shade structures that can become little retail centers if they need to be. Uh, public art can also reduce blight, and I think probably one of our most successful projects uh, was the Right, uh, right to uh, Right the Blight project. Uh, and the artist uh, that we hired for this project, his name is, um, we actually hired ten artists, but this this artist at this specific site uh, is Jesse Hernandez. He goes by uh, the moniker Urban Aztec. And if you don't know this location, this is the underpass at uh, the San Carlos Street Bridge along Dupont Avenue. In the 80s, it was known as the Walls of Fame. 
That's where a lot of graffiti artists would go and try and make a name for themselves. Uh, in more recently, uh, 2017 and 18, when the My San Jose app came out, uh, this became the number one hotspot. There were more than 500 tags that year at this location, and the cost to remove those tags was, was significant. So the artist we brought on board, Jesse Hernandez, worked with the community. Uh, he listened to the, 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 the site users. There was a lot of youth that, that hung out at the site, and he, he really heard from them. And they're like, you know, if the, the artwork isn't tough, it's not going to get respected. And so he kind of went in with the mindset that, okay, I need to generate something that's going to going to be tough. And so he created these really uh, beautiful murals, were very elaborate uh, in 2020. And these have been out there for two years and we've only received two tags. So we went from 500 tags a year to two tags in two years. Uh, we estimate that that's about $120,000 savings to the taxpayer every year on graffiti removal. So that's a, a huge a huge uh, savings and it really beautified the area and and just activated now it's it's sort of a popular destination for for uh, photo ops public art can honor and memorialize history people and culture and there is a lot of that in this city and uh, one of my i think one of the most important monuments we have in the city is the japanese american internment memorial by artist ruth asawa uh, that was installed in 1994 this is up out by the federal courthouse if you've not had a chance to go spend uh, a half hour an hour with this i highly encourage you to do so it's it's worth a walk downtown to visit this and just uh, see the elaborate bas relief uh engraving and 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 just artwork on this on this monument. It's a powerful monument. Um, we also have the Arch of Dignity, Justice, and Equality at the San Jose uh, University campus. And uh, this this is uh, by artist Judy Judy Baca, who's really quite a famous muralist, and she um, she worked with with our program as well as with the university to to create this this piece, this beautiful piece. Um, Man of Fire by Kim Yasuda. Uh, this is on the uh, Plaza uh, Paseo de San Antonio. Uh, you, you might be familiar with this work. It honors, uh, excuse me, it, 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 it honors uh, the, the history of, uh, I'm sorry, the, the name isn't coming to me right now, but it, 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 it's, it's important history regarding uh, a teacher who taught within the city about the history of, of uh, just the farm worker uh, alliance uh, and, and just the equality measures that were sought during this time. Um, Power of One by Irish Chain, uh, excuse me, by Richard Deutsch. This is Irish Chain Park. This is a memorial park that honors uh, Irish uh, Chang. Uh, she was a poet and writer. And the one of the strong ideas or one of the ideas that was the impetus of much of her writing is that one person can be like a ripple, uh, be, be like a pebble in the water and, and the ripple effects from that one person can be uh, incredible. And so you see a stone that's centered in this park that really kind of ripples outward. And there's a real nice movement to this park. It's really quite beautiful. If you've, if you've not had a chance to go uh, walk this park, I highly recommend it. Uh, Alone Woman, this is outside the Al, Al uh, Almaden Community Center by Lisa Reinertsen. Really, really quite beautiful sculpture. It's bronze. Uh, of course, Plume Serpent. Plume Serpent can, uh, this is one of those sculptures that has, uh, there's two sides. You either like it or you don't. And I don't I think, I don't think I've met anybody with uh, an opinion of, of anything in between. It's, uh, the sculpture itself is really based off of uh, Mexican, uh, Mesoamerican, Aztec sculpture. If you if you look at at ancient sculptures that have been done uh, in regards to Quetzalcoatl, there's a lot of similarities to the way the structure lays out, and uh, and that this is this sculpture really really does emulate that. Tula Centuries. This is at the Tropicana Shopping Center, right out right by the Target. Uh, this was a, a private funded project, but we did help manage this and worked with the community to create these um, almost Olmec type uh, statues that are really, really fantastic. They're really beautiful. Uh, sometimes the history that's honored uh, comes before us, well before us. Uh, we So uh, during some construction, 
along the Guadalupe River. Uh, the uh, skeleton of a mammoth, mammoth was unearthed. And around this time, we were, we were working with, with the uh, parks team, uh, trails team specifically, to create some artworks that honored the history. And, and the artists really took to that and designed this, this statue, this sculpture. So public art can also engage uh, technology and push the boundaries of innovation. Uh, the Space Observer piece at, at the airport Terminal B, this is at the Mineta Airport, really quite a beautiful piece. Uh, the robot will follow you. It does have sensors on it and it has a camera. And it can seem a little bit daunting when you see yourself in that screen, but please know nothing is recorded. And it's just sort of a fun, playful thing to show passers-by the, the capability of technology. It's a mix of old and new technology. There's really a, a cross between those, those, those histories. Uh, this is recently installed a million times since a million times for San Jose. It's by humans since 1982. And these clocks are choreographed. Uh, all, every little hand has a choreographed element and sometimes they're synchronized, sometimes they're not, but they always come back at the end of the minute to give you the time. It's really a beautiful piece. And we, we do a lot of work that's, that was temporary at the airport. We, we don't do temporary projects so much as, as the budget for that is, is not existent anymore. But uh, this was one of our temporary projects where an infinity mirror was created by our artist, Carlos Rolón. And one of the largest murals in the, in the nation is on the Terminal B parking garage. And it's called Hands. And all of these hands, that was really inspired by the, the work of people that work in this, this city and the things that they create and they do with their hands. And that, that's really where the inspiration for this comes. Uh, and another one of our temporary projects at the airport. This was before emojis. This is when emoticons were big, so circa 2010. And luggage would come off of the conveyor belt and create these sort of these emoticons for people to uh, just sort of smile and laugh at and have a little bit of a reprieve at the end of a trip. Public art can provide necessary commissions to artists in times of need. Uh, our project Holding the Moment employed 90 artists in the city uh, during the time when many artists lost commissions. This was right at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, it was an exhibit that was installed at the airport for six months. Uh, we, we, each month we would change out the exhibit and all artists were paid to display their work at the airport. Public art can also enhance community centers, libraries, retail shopping centers, and even zoos. I'm not gonna to say too much about each of these projects because I think I'm running short on time and I wanna make sure we have some time for, for folks to ask questions. But this is, this is your public art, this is in your city. You can go out anytime and, and look at these works and, and enjoy them. Public art can also create greater environmental respect and awareness, and we do have quite a few projects that, that do that. Uh, this is a project that captures rainwater and then feeds a prune, um, uh, prune trees that, that are legacy prune trees outside of this building that have been there a long time. Uh, this is another one that captures rainwater off of the Roosevelt Community Center and filters it through this. It looks like a this little spiral thing, this is actually a thumbprint of the artist, it's magnified. So the water goes through the artist's thumbprint, through pumice, and before it hits the watershed, that pumice purifies that water. Uh, this is a project that you might see all over town. We worked with uh, artist Carlos Perez, as well as uh, poet Mike, Mighty Mike McGee, and youth from, from San Jose. Many students participated in this, uh, submitted poems, that were then designed by artist Carlos Perez and installed on new litter cans that went into 15 business districts, districts citywide. And this is, a, I had mentioned a storm pump. Uh, this is out at Alviso and the storm pump station has a Ba ceramic tile mural that talks about the history, the, the really wonderful history of the Alviso community. And this is another project that that really kind of, uh, in, in a way, it, it, it highlights the infrastructure of uh, and the, the, the real workers at the regional wastewater facility. And not that the people are not the real workers, but these are the methanogens uh, magnified uh, by an uh, electron microscope. 
and these these turn sewage into um, into power. Basically, it converts it to to gas that can be used to, to power the facility. And though we don't receive any percent funding for um, housing, uh, we do our part to try and make sure we we help out with the um, with affordable housing by providing free houses for uh, our, our aviary residents. And public art can also be fun. Here's some works uh, you might be familiar with, Sonic Runway outside of City Hall. Stay tuned for that. We do look to be to have programming on that for the next um, next year where artists can come out, musicians can come out and activate the runway with, with, their, with their creations. Okay, well, that, that is it. Thank you very much. And uh, if anybody would like to ask questions. So, Michael, thank you. It's Sal. And uh, as our traveling mics are getting up, if you have a question in the audience, please uh, stand up. But I'm going to start with a question uh, that we have from Zoom, which is, uh, is there any data on what percentage of dollars awarded go to local artists? Is there any policy that gives preferences preference to local artists? Yes, that's a good question. We, we do have that data. I, I don't have that on me right now, but uh, the history of the program uh, is uh, in the last 35 years, it's almost split between the funding that goes to local and the funding that goes to artists that, that, that are not local. And, uh, and so that there's, that's kind of the, the dividing and, and yes, we do, we do work to show within the legal parameters, often when we have any federal funding involved, we cannot legally show preference to an applicant based off of where they live. Uh, it's, it's really about qualifications and do they qualify for the project? But if it's not, if there's no federal funding involved, we can allow for uh, preference for local artists on projects. Good to know. Hey, Fernando. Yes, thanks. Um, the name of that uh, one that you could not remember is Dr. Ernesto Galarza. Mm -hmm. He was an outstanding um, academician, got a PhD out of Stanford. Uh, as a former farm worker, he went on to become one of the outstanding leaders in our community. And it is that table that's between the former Fairmont Hotel and the building next to it that used to be McCormick and Schmick is a table that illustrates Dr. Galarza and a lot of his sayings that are embedded in the bronze uh, walkway from Market Street to San Jose State. Thank you, Fernando. Yeah, Don? thank you. Michael, I just wanted you to know that uh, this Rotary Club did graffiti abatement before the city would do it. Uh, okay. They refused, the city refused to do it, and a group of 10 or 12 of our members uh, grabbed a rig and went out and started doing uh, sound walls. And we did that for seven or eight years before the city finally decided it was a good idea. Thank you for leading the way. Carl Salas. Hey, Michael. Uh, I just stumbled across that great flower you put on the convention center the other day. I'm on my bike a lot. And I, didn't, I hadn't seen a lot of the things you showed today. Fantastic, really fantastic. Is there a list, um, kind of like this presentation, but just one list that would show where the address is of all those wonderful things? That's question one. Question two is, you know, I love the hands at the airport, but when I go there at night, you can't see them because the lights behind make it so you can't see them. Have you ever thought about putting lights, exterior lights shining up on those things so you see the hands at night too? Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, in regards to the first question, yes, all of the artworks in our collection are on the city website. Just uh, type in C C City of San Jose Public Art Collection to uh, Google or even on the city website, and it will bring up that page. Uh, in regards to Terminal B Parking Garage, our, our budget was restricted uh, to, to strictly the facade enhancement. Um, and unfortunately, we weren't able to include illumination as part of that because it was just it was just uh, it far exceeded our capacity, our budget capacity to do something like that. But it is a, a it is a great idea. And I, I agree with you. It, it would be fantastic to have that illuminated in the evening. Thank you, Michael. We've got Ashley. Um, <clears throat> so my question is, Currently, what is the biggest art project we have in the office? Are you talking about in scale, like physically, or are you talking about uh, community involvement? Either. Either or both. <laughs> Either or both. I mean, I, I would say that like we probably just finished our our largest largest project, which was Sonic Runway, 
um, that, that occupies a pretty significant footprint. There is also a lot of uh, infrastructure complexity to that project to make that happen. Um, and then as far as crowd size, I mean, when we when we do performances and, and just visitations, the first time we installed that, it was estimated that 1.2 million people visited it during the six months that it was was installed. So it's it's large on, on in, a, in a number of ways. Um, and then currently within our within our project wheelhouse, I mean, we've got uh, the police memorial we're working on. Um, we have an, we have 17 mural projects that are planned uh, citywide. We have a number of other infrastructure projects, such as the Emergency Operations Center. Uh, we have a huge facade treatment that's going to be going on that. Uh, we just finished Fire Station 37, and the fun artwork on that uh, was really well received. Uh, we have six more fire stations that are going to be coming. That's all through the Measure T ordinance. And I don't know how large those are going to be or what, what's going to materialize from those. But uh, that that's really uh, part of the creative process. And so that, that will come up. And then you know, you can if, if you're interested in more, I, I, we have our work plan. It's all it's all posted on the Arts Commission website, and, and you can you can actually take a look and see all of the projects that are that are posted. And generally, the larger the budget, the larger the project. So, but sometimes we get some really large projects from from smaller budgets. So that that doesn't always uh, mean that. Great, thank you, Michael. And I think that's all the time we have. Okay, thank you. Everyone. So. On, on the lines of art, I want to let you know that a donation has been made in your name to San Jose Jazz's Jazz Aid Fund, and we really appreciate you sharing all of this public art with us. So, on to next week. Uh, we are going to keep the good times rolling next week with a wine reception from Bert George. Thank you, Bert. Uh, we are also going to do Ring the Bell. We are also going to have another fun musical performance tied to San Jose Jazz's upcoming Summerfest. And our speaker will be Seo Young Kim, who will be letting us know about cryptocurrency. So please come on back for that or join us on Zoom. Meeting adjourned.